Good afternoon. And most of the students up there, and even some of the faculty, may know me as the guy who sings really loud in chapel. <laughs> See? I don't. There's also even a rumor that I don't sing on key. I may have to uh, take that up with you later. No, seriously, even 40 years ago, I had a habit of singing. In fact, I stood on those stairs, and I have another thing that you all should be grateful that you don't have to wear. Imagine me as five years old, standing in the pre-K room, <laughs> singing at the top of my lungs uh, from Man of La Mancha to dream an impossible dream. <laughs> And that dream has come true today to be with all of you. And really, uh, Cervantes talks about heroes and talks about courage. And the heroes today are all of you. First and foremost, these beautiful, beautiful, powerful human beings that we um, give all of our blessings to that are walking into this world, to the teachers, the administrators, and the parents. You are all the heroes today. Now, when a hero uh, goes on a uh, mission, they, they require um, some gifts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sharing five stories with you, three of which are going to be the gifts. One story is going to be about the failure of when those gifts aren't all working together. And another of the stories is going to be the success, a really powerful story of a young man who actually has taken those gifts and has changed the world in a, in a powerful way. But before I get there, I did take some time to meet with some of your teachers and get a few impressions. And I want to share some of those stories that, um, that stick out. First, how many of you were there at the spring concert this year? Did you see a show of hands? Everyone remember Eleanor and uh, Jeffrey singing? Was that beautiful? The courage, let's give them a round of applause again. Needs courage. And, and Jeffrey and Eleanor, I really was, I really was touched. Eleanor in that bright red dress. I went up to her afterwards. She must have thought I was a kook because I was so enthusiastic. Um, and uh, and Rio, you spoke so beautifully today. Thank you. Give a round of applause. And uh, I couldn't help but see myself. I was on that instrument crew when we first began going up to the Performing Arts Center and I got to move all the ORF instruments. So there we see Rio. She's got her penny whistle. She's got her uh, a recorder, she's singing, she's dancing, she's moving the instrument, she's playing everything. Uh, you just brought so much joy and light to that performance. Um, I think of um, Eric, I heard a story about you. Where's Eric? Raise your hand so everyone can see you. All right. This, this really touched my heart as an athlete. Um, this year he was injured for most of the time and had to sit on the sideline. Can you imagine that, being a really star athlete and not being able to get up there and help the team? But he helped the team in a different way because he was there every single moment. And I heard the story that how at the end of the season, the team, his teammates called him out and his dad, because he had to watch his dad coach the team, and let him take the three throw. Eric, did you make that shot, by the way? No. <laughs> he was at the line, though. That's what counts. Other athletes, I learned about, um, I learned about Jake. Jake, can you raise your hands for everyone? OK, thank you. He's, here's a guy who's traveling all over the world um, uh, for hockey. You know, when each of these students travel, just like a, another student I'm going to talk about, Maya, who I know, uh, I kind of know her father, Seth Pollock, a professor. I know him on a casual basis. But this family traveled to South Africa, and when uh, Jake and Maya come back with their experiences of seeing the world and interacting with the world, we are changed. And I understand that they really did an amazing job of sharing what they learned in all of those travels. So we celebrate that. And of course, Toby, you are a leader extraordinaire. Uh, when my uh, daughter, uh, who is all of five years old, and Gabriel, who's all of eight years old, come back and say, hey, Toby, talk to us. <laughs> it really touched them. And of course, playing the drums. And I heard wonderful stories of being in Washington and, and how um, Mrs. Muddy needed a little help. Uh, she would, you raised your voice. But most of all, you know what struck me the most about you guys that I heard? Was that you held and you do hold each other in each other's hands. That the rhetoric that you've heard this morning is not rhetoric. It is Catalina. 
I know it because I wouldn't be standing here, I wouldn't be the person I am if it wasn't real. And I heard stories about how each of you helped each other to become a family. That that wasn't just something that happened, it wasn't something coerced by your parents. Okay, so let me get on to um, these stories, otherwise you're all going to be here for two hours and I know you don't want that. Um, first story is really a failure of what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you exactly this moment what these three gifts are. I'm going to share one that was a failure. Um, you all remember 2011, September 11th, I mean 2001? Okay, you were still young, but we've all grown up with that. Well, I was traveling in the airport, and it was shortly after 9-11, and I'm there at the gate, and off towards the boarding area was a family that appeared to be Muslim. And I was astounded as I watched people all around at that gate begin to step away. In fact, when people got in line, I actually saw people push this family. And I found myself getting pulled into this myself. I felt my own fears rising up. And I realized that I had had a failure of heart. I had had a failure of judgment, compassion, and mercy. Luckily, it didn't stick with me, but it was a profound reminder of how all of us are prey if we're not vigilant. So my first gift to you is about judgment. It's about judgment. And I want to share two scenes from two movies to point out what I feel is this powerful gift of judgment. Uh, how many of you have seen, just see a show of hands, uh, either read or seen the movie Lord of the Rings? Some of you have been. Okay, guys, it's a classic story, good versus evil. Definitely go out and see it or read the book if you haven't. And there's a good wizard and there's a bad wizard. And, of course, the bad wizard is waiting to become the all-powerful wizard if he can just get the last ring. And there's innocence. There are these hobbits that uh, now, this one hobbit in particular, who is going to be carrying this ring. Well, there's another character um, who was a hobbit that for 500 plus years carried the ring. And his name was Smeagol, but he has gone from being this light-hearted creature, a hobbit, to becoming this deformed, depraved, his face is all just absolutely wretched. And he has been transformed by the desire for power and holding on to his precious and everybody remembers just that sound. And so, um, in the movie, um, the main character, Frodo, um, is talking to this wise wizard, and he's saying, I, I wish this other s golem wasn't even around us. I wish he wasn't following us, was trying to steal the ring, trying to take it from you. It would be better if he were dead. Anybody remember how Gandalf, the wise wizard, responds to him? He says, even the wise do not know the end of all things. Even the wise do not know the end of all things. So this wretched, horrible, evil creature that, by all appearances, it would be better if he were dead, he wanted, he said, we don't know. And I won't ruin the movie for you, but let's just say that this Smeagol character, who had become this Gollum wretched character, plays a very, very important role. All right, what about Star Wars? Who saw Phantom Menace? Show of hands. Oh, wow. Gosh, I'm dating myself, aren't I? Well, it's another one of these classic battles of good and evil. And in and, um, Darth Vader, you've all heard of Darth Vader, right? Just nod your head. Just, just help me out here, otherwise you're gonna, be, you're gonna be stuck in those seats if you don't help me. Okay. Uh, Darth, Darth Vader uh, is a boy, and he's Anakin Skywalker, and he is... Uh, perceived to be perhaps a prophet, the one that they were waiting for because there's good force and there's bad force and there was an imbalance and the evil side was starting to win. And there are all these wise characters, you know, Yoda and all these Jedi masters. Go to Disneyland if you haven't, you'll see the whole thing there too. Um, and um, when Anakin, this little boy, is presented to Yoda and to all the Jedi masters, they're like, no, 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 we don't want anything to do with this. Too much fear in this boy. And he's too old. No, the laws, our rules say, don't take this boy. But what happens is somehow they realize, even Yoda realizes, because Obi-Wan Kenobi makes a commitment that maybe there's something different about this boy. Or maybe they can't judge 
maybe they really don't know what the end is, even if it doesn't feel right. And in fact, later on, we find out in the story, there's almost no Jedis left. And yet somehow in the end, the good does win. But I won't ruin the story there, too. Judgment. The ability to suspend, to be able to accept that everyone has a journey, a mysterious journey. Your journey is your journey. It is unique. No one's journey will be like your journey. And we need to be accepting of each other's journey, hold each other's journeys in our hearts. <coughs> Second gift, compassion. I really like the word compassion even more than empathy, and, I'll, and you'll see in a moment why. This comes from a wonderful book that I can't recommend enough, and no, it wasn't written by me. You can laugh. Um, this book is by Gregory Boyle, who started Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, which is about helping gang members, people coming out of prison who have been gang members, and showing them uh, what micro-entrepreneurship can be about and trying to give them a new opportunity. This book is called uh, Tattoos on the Heart, and the story goes like this. There's a mother whose son had just come back from the Iraq war. So imagine this, His, her son had literally been on the front lines, grown up in a ghetto where he was in the front lines of gangs, had gone over to the other side of the world and fought for our country and put his life on the line and came back. And she was so happy to have her son. Well, her son goes down the street to Jack in the Box or McDonald's to, to get a burger after being home barely a day or two. And as he's coming out, um, a bunch of gang members walk on over to him, and they start harassing him. They're like, hey, dude, hey, dog, what gang are you in? Come on, what gang are you in? And of course, he's not a member of any of these gangs. They continue to harass him. Well, he's trying to get away from them. He's trying to get away from them. Need I say that before he gets to his house, to the steps where his mother's going to open the door, he's shot. The mother opens the door, and her son falls into her arms. Falls into her arms. The mother goes into an incredible grief. Can't even describe the grief. For six months, she will not go out of the house. She's wearing black. She won't put on late lipstick. She won't do anything for herself. Finally, her other son says, Ma, come on. We're never, it's never going to be the same, but we've got to go on. You've got to, got to go out of the house. We've got to start living our lives. You've got to do that for him, for you, for me, for us. So she does. What do you think is going to happen to her second son? It's not more than two months later, and her son, in a very similar situation, walking down the street, gets harangued by, harassed by a gang. And what do you think happens to him? Shot, killed, dies in his mother's arms. Now, at this point, the mother's grief is unbearable, absolutely unbearable. She's beginning to have heart problems, and she herself is taken to the emergency room because her heart is almost in failure. And she's sitting there on a gurney. And what should happen, but at that same time that she was in the emergency room waiting to be treated, another gurney comes in with a young man. And the young man was a member of the same gang that had shot her two sons. And the mother, in this moment, there are two thoughts going through her head. Immediately, she's almost hearing the voices of her friends saying, ah, justice is finally done. Justice is finally done. Hope that boy dies. But then there's the voice of her heart. And all that mother can think about is the other mother. And she prays with all her might, don't let that boy die because I know what it's like to be that mother. From incredible suffering, incredible pain, compassion, an ability of imagination to go beyond our own minds, our own experiences. That is a compassion that all of us can only pray and hope that we may be graced with in our life. That's the second gift I give you. First judgment, second compassion. The third gift is mercy. And I can't verify whether this story is true, but I believe it is, especially since I'm a big fan of Pope John Paul II. 
And the story goes like this. There had been a, a priest who had done his training in Rome and had returned to Rome um, for a visit. And in fact, he was going to get a visit with the Pope. That's just where all the priests line up and they basically get a shake of hand. Even that's a, a big deal to meet the head honcho. And uh, before this wonderful uh, event is to occur, he's out walking the streets of Rome and he goes to one of the steps of the church and he's about ready to walk in and light a candle, say a prayer before his meeting. And he looks down and he sees, he sees someone and, and he does a double take. And he says, I know this, I know this person. And it was a beggar, someone in, in torn rags, but he looks carefully and then and he says, and, he says to him, do, do I know you? And he says, the guy says, I, I don't know. And then they lock eyes and he realizes that this was a priest that he had done seminarian work with. He did indeed know this priest who was now a beggar in front of a church. Well, he was kind of shaken by this and later that afternoon when he's standing in line to meet the Pope, you know, he's bending down, gonna kiss the ring and go through the, the formal um, greeting of the Pope and he blurts out, um, your, your Excellency, your, your dear father, I, I saw this man today in front of the church. And he begins to quickly tell the story as quickly as you can in that kind of situation. Well, later that afternoon, he was back in his hotel and he gets a call from the Pope's secretary who says, I want you to go find that man and bring him to dinner tonight. You're coming to dinner at the uh, Vatican. So the guy goes out and he goes, looks for the uh, beggar priest. He finds him. And uh, the beggar priest is not exactly enthusiastic. He's like, look at me. You think I'm going to go and visit the Pope tonight? How could I possibly do that? And the priest says, no, no, no. Look, it's OK. Look, I got, let's go back to my hotel. You can wash up. I've got some clothes for you. Please, if the Holy Father asked you to come, you, you must honor his request. So they do that, and they go to the dinner. And they get through the dinner, and uh, right before dessert, they um, ask, the Pope asks everyone to leave the room. So everyone leaves the room except the beggar priest and the Pope. About half hour goes by. Everyone's then let back in the room. They have dessert and then everyone leaves. And the beggar priest is talking to the priest who had found him, who had, who had brought him to that dinner. And the, and the priest says, well, what happened in there? You guys, it was a, it was a half hour before we even had dessert. What, what happened? And he said, you won't believe this. The Pope got down on his knees and begged me to hear his confession. And of course I said, Holy Father, I'm not even a priest anymore. How could I possibly hear your confession? And he said, hear my confession. And then he commanded me because he said, I'm the Pope and you need to hear my confession. So I heard the Pope's confession. And then the Pope asked to hear my confession. And then the Pope asked me, if I would be a priest again, and if I would go and work with the beggars in the same church where I was. So the Pope has reinstated me as a priest, and all of this has happened. Mercy. We're all beggars. We really all are beggars in God's kingdom and in God's journey for us. And what an amazing story of mercy. Judgment, compassion, mercy. These are the gifts that your teachers and others want you to have. They're also the ones that Eli and Rio, you spoke in so beautifully about, and you had examples to point to and believe that those are things that you have learned here at this institution. So, um, what does it look like? Well, I want to tell you another story, brief story, about a young man who has put judgment, compassion, and mercy to work in a very profound way. Um, this little boy lived in a village in South Sudan called Tonj. And his father was fighting in the Second Sudan Civil War, fighting the, with the Liberation Army. And when he was seven years old, his mother was killed. He saw his mother being killed. So this little boy then is swept up with about thousands of other, other little boys, and they're taken off to Ethiopia, where they're promised to be given education and to be taken care of. Well, of course, that's not really how the story goes. These young boys are taught to be soldiers. They were taught to hate. He describes in his own words that all I had in my heart was I wanted to carry my AK-47 and to kill Muslims. That's all he had in his heart. That's what they taught him. 
The fighting became so intense that he and a bunch of other boys finally escaped, and they went to the wild. And on that way, horrible things happened. Many of the, most of those boys of that thousand or so that left died. Some of them had to actually eat each other. And I hate to be visual about this, but they, we are sitting here on an island in Monterey, as many of you know, a beautiful island, a blessed island, but an island nonetheless. And um, he runs up with a woman by the name of Emma McCoon, who also sweeps him up, takes him off to Nairobi, and says, I want something different for you. You've escaped, and I want you to have a different life. And she, and she begins to make sure that he has an education. And actually, she dies shortly thereafter, but people around her ensure that this young man actually begins in Kenya to learn and to be educated and to, to change. Well, music was powerful for this little boy, and he began creating hip-hop and music. Do any of you know who Emmanuel Jal is? Any of you see Blood Diamonds? In that movie, there's a rap, and that rap is by this artist, Emmanuel Jal. And he's now gone on to build orphanages and to help people, and it's through the music that he feels, I am a war child, but I have a reason to live. I have hope to give. I have stories to tell, and I will tell them. Really powerful. And his albums are wonderful. There's another album called Gua, which combines Swahili and um, Arabic, Sudanese uh, Arabic, and that he even did collaborations with uh, Muslim. Very powerful thing. Success. But are we all going to be called to such grand ways to use our judgment, our compassion and mercy? Perhaps. But there are also the little ways. I know as a father, there's a, there's a daily struggles of how do I discipline and how do I love? There are the moments of lack of patience. And all of these are opportunities to show judgment compassion and mercy. You too, you're going to be walking in, you said nine different high schools, was that right Eli? Okay, nine different high schools, wow. You're going to be walking into these new environments, you're going to meet new people, they're going to change in front of your eyes, they're going to want to be respected and recognized, they're going to gravitate towards wanting to be the center of attention, you'll begin to feel strong attractions, all these wonderful things. Those are going to be opportunities for you not to judge each other, but to hold each other's journey sacred. That doesn't mean you don't have strong ideas, decisions, and that you don't act decisively knowing what's right, but hold each other's journey sacred. So I'm just about ready to end, but I have two last tokens that I want to leave you with. First of all, for those of you who said I couldn't sing, my first token's gonna be a song. <laughs> I warned you, didn't I? When I was in about fifth or sixth grade, this was a song I sang. I can still see myself standing on, this, on the stage of the Performing Arts Center, and it goes like this. You are a promise. You are a possibility. You are a promise with a capital P. You are a great big bundle of potentiality. Pretty good. Huh? And you're a learning to hear God's voice and you're trying to make the right choice cause you're a promise to be anything God wants you to be come on bring it on <laughs> and seriously as my last moments the final token I want to give you is really this beautiful idea that Thomas Kempis talks about God engraving his name on each of your hearts. And Isaiah talks about how God calls us each by name, and God delights in each and every one of us. So hold yourself up as you think about the mystery of what your journey is going to be, and none of us know what that is. You are like a crystal glass bowl a diamond with all these different cuts and facets to it. And the sun is shining through, and your creator is holding you in his hand and is delighting and saying, there is none like you. God bless you. God bless your parents. God bless this beautiful school. And may your journey be rich. And may you come back 40 years from now, or sooner, I hope, and share your stories and your love. Thank you very much.